Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Marin. Welcome. I'll be the moderator of tonight's forum. This is hosted by the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara. Tonight we will hear from the candidates for California State Assembly District 37. We hope this forum will inform you, the voters, of the candidates' views on, in, on areas of interest to you. One important note, the League of Women Voters never endorses or opposes individual candidates. We do this as part of our mission. Once again, thank you very much for coming out tonight. I'm sure you all would much rather be home watching the State of the Union, but... <laughs> Well, okay. So thank you. Th thank you for coming. And thanks to Sylvia Uribe of Transil Pro, who will be providing simultaneous translation from English to Spanish. Headphones are available upon request. Also like to thank Gary Adkins Sound Systems for the audio. Thanks also to TVSB for videotaping the forum. This video will be available online at the League's YouTube website, available at lwvsb.org. So the candidates' campaign materials are out there in the hallway if you want to take some when you leave. Uh, there's also information about the League of Women Voters, our organization. I am also a member of the League. The League is open to men. Been a member for almost 20 years now. So please uh, consider joining us. Uh, all of you are welcome to join. As I mentioned, there are scholarships available to help. And also, you can make tax-deductible contributions. I will be repeating that between each candidate the whole night long. <laughs> But you can make those contributions to the LWVSB Education Fund. Thank you, candidates, for being here tonight. Thank you for that. This is how the forum works. We're going to start off with some prepared questions from the League of Women Voters. Uh, the candidates all know the rules tonight. We will uh, maintain civility and focus on the issues. Uh, we do not allow negative comments from the candidates about others or qualifications, some of that. But we'll run a tight ship. After I ask each question, our candidates have a timer up there on the left where they'll be able to see how much time is remaining. When it gets to zero candidates, I will cut you off so that we can keep moving. Um, we're going to give candidates two minutes for opening statements. Then we're going to do those one-minute questions. Then we're going to take a very short break and gather questions from the audience with uh, passing out cards. So we won't have time to do too many, but we'll take those questions and try to get the best ones in, hopefully to cover as many issues as you have. Um, we do not take questions from the audience at a microphone, but you can pass in those cards. Uh, with that, I think uh, we might as well get started. And uh, with that, the way we're going to do this is candidates, we're going to start with Kathy Murillo. We're going to work our way down. At the end of the night, we'll reverse the order for the closing statements. Kathy, you see the timer. You have two minutes. Please begin. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kathy Murillo, mayor of Santa Barbara, and proud to be a candidate for state assembly. Please vote for me and send a strong progressive candidate to Sacramento. My dedication to public service comes directly from my personal history. I come from a family of strong women, a union family, a family that votes in every election. I grew up in East Los Angeles, raised by my mother and grandmother because my father was serving time in prison. These challenges made me work hard in school and spend my afternoons in the public library. At UCSB, I studied the fine arts and after graduation, settled in Santa Barbara with my younger sister, Carol. I worked as a theater arts uh, teacher in public schools. I've worked as a legal secretary. And because of my uh, writing skills and interest in government, I was a journalist for 15 years. Three of those years, I lived and worked in Ventura County as a news reporter. I ran successfully for city council in 2011, motivated to be a pro-environment force on a city council that was opposing bicycle lanes and uh, they wouldn't take action to protect our marine environment. I am the first Latina ever elected to the Santa Barbara City Council, and I've worked hard on voter registration in the Latino community. And because of my father, my signature community project is gang prevention and youth empowerment. My goals in the assembly are to improve public education, uh, protect our natural resources, and create housing and job security for all Californians. I offer my executive leadership experience as the mayor of a full service charter city in the state of California. And I look forward to serving you as your next assembly member. I ask for your vote. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next candidate is Charles Cole. Hello, I am Charles Cole. Uh, I, I'm running for this office because I believe it's time for a change in our government. It, our government is out of control, inefficient, and misdirected. And I'm looking to, if not solve the problem or help solve the problem, to at least not add to the problem of overbloated government. So uh, <laughs> moving on to me, I am a 22-year-old Republican. I was a student at Santa Barbara High School. I went to City College and then decided to run. I have a background in accounting, in business, and statistics. And I believe all that will be able to help me um, help me balance California's overspending and massive debt, or at least help to do so. And I hope for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate is Jason Dominguez. Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be running for assembly. I have passion for the issues that we need people to bring solutions to Sacramento on. I also have a track record, and I have experience in these issues. It's not enough for people to pay lip service to wanting to solve these problems, but you need people who have accomplishments. And so I'm very excited. I grew up in a very poor part of Los Angeles where education was helped, is what helped get my family out of that situation, and I've taught for 10 years. I'm an attorney. I was started my career as a prosecutor. I also worked for the United Nations for three years in The Hague doing war crimes prosecution, and since then I've split my time between teaching and working in nonprofits. So I'm really excited to run. I'm excited for the opportunity to explore ideas. California is a state where we should be leading the nation. We should be leading the nation in education policy, tech policy, the environment, but we've really fallen down on our laurels. So I ask you to be open-minded and to think about electing new leaders for Santa Barbara and Ventura, new leadership and new ideas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next candidate is Jonathan Aboud. Thank you all for being here. My name is Jonathan Aboud. I'm running to be your next state assembly member. I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. My parents immigrated to this country from Lebanon in the late 80s, early 90s. My mom is actually here with us today. And I, I got, we grew up in a part of Los Angeles, also working class, immigrant, low income. And we grew up next to an oil field and a major highway, and that taught me about environmental injustice. We had underfunded schools, and my mom, she did something big. She got me transferred from one public high school to another one, and that taught me about the massive inequities in our education system and awakened me politically to ask the question, why are there good schools and bad schools in the first place? I ended up coming to UC Santa Barbara in 2010, and I've lived in the Central Coast now for 10 years. At UCSB, I majored in political science and got my master's degree in technology management, which is like a business degree. I was student body president at UCSB during a tough year and during a time when education was being cut at the state level and locally we had a mass shooting, we had a riot, we had many public safety issues and so I decided to stay in Isla Vista and work to create self-governance and a local government for our town. And I'm happy to say we did create the Isla Vista Community Services District, where I now serve as the general manager, the executive of the agency. At the same time, in 2014, I ran for the City College, Santa Barbara City College Board of Trustees, where I've been elected now for five years. I was re-elected in 2018, and I'm the youngest community college trustee in the state of California. I'm running on the values that we prosper only when everyone prospers, and that if we can imagine ambitious and transformative change, in our society to bring that prosperity to all, we need to do all we can to make it happen. I'm really excited to be here today to answer the questions, to hear from you, and this has been a great journey so far, and I'm looking forward to the last four weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate is Elsa Granados. For almost 23 years, my partner and I have made the 37th District our home. This is where we work and volunteer to make our community a better place. I want to be your next assembly member because I want to use my leadership skills to develop the solutions to better our community. I have been a public servant for over three and a half decades. I know that I can make a difference in the most pressing social, economic, and environmental issues that we face 
Why? Because I have a track record of, of creating change. In my role of an executive director for our local rape crisis center, I've worked on public policy in Sacramento as a board member of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And I've worked with members of the state legislature uh, to sponsor legislation that affects the survivors of sexual assault. I've worked with colleagues to affect the language of the Violence Against Women Act, a piece of legislation at the federal level that funds all rape crisis centers and domestic violence serving centers. Um, prior to coming to Santa Barbara, I uh, worked for the Mayor's Office of Children, Youth, and Families. And in that role, I conducted research and set, helped to set public policy to, to disseminate over $13 million to the most vulnerable populations in the San Francisco Bay Area. I have a strong understanding of state and federal regulations. Every year, the Rape Crisis Center is subject to an audit, and every year I've gotten a clean audit. That means that I'm using the funds in the way that the taxpayers and the legislation intends. Um, I, through formal education, community involvement, and civic engagement, I have learned how government can interact with other entities to create um, benefit for the community. I will use that and the legislative process to create positive outcomes for my district. Thank you. Our next candidate is Stephen Blum. Good evening. Um, thanks for the invitation. I always like to come to the League of Women Voter uh, deals. I even brought my League of Women Voters pens. <laughs> and um, I'd like to take this opportunity to encourage you to donate to the League. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, Tough audience, I can see. Um, anyway, I, I am running, obviously, for assembly district. Um, I am confident that I have the resume, the experience, the knowledge, and the skill set to do this job well. Unfortunately for me, mo all these people on the dais do, too. So it's, a, it's good for the voters. You've got a, a, a lot of good choices. A um, little bit about my background. Uh, I've served in many leadership positions. I was the... Um, Teachers Union President in Ventura for 12 years. I served 12 years on the Ventura County Community College Board of Trustees, and five of those years I was also on the California Community College State Board. I've taught for 30 plus years at both Buena High School, Ventura High School, and now at Cal Lutheran University. I coached for 22 years track and cross country at uh, Buena High School. Um, I'm like I said, I'm currently teaching school law at Cal Lutheran. I'm also a state appointed attorney who represents, represents mentally, Ill, um, mentally ill clients. Got a bachelor's in history, a master's in education, and a juris doctorate in law. But the biggest, I think, skill I have to offer is I, ha for some reason, I, and I have a knack for bringing people together, getting people to work together to solve problems. Um, and, um, why I'm running, people are kind of always ask that, why would you want to do that for? Um, and to me, California and the country is, is kind of at a crossroads. We've got a lot of issues and a lot of problems, and I want to help solve them. And I'm out of time, so you're lucky. <laughs> thank you. Our next candidate is Steve Bennett. Thank you, David. I would like to thank the Santa Barbara League of Women Voters for giving us this opportunity to present ourselves and, and communicate with the public. Um, I believe I have a background uh, that is especially suited for the challenges that California faces right now. I spent uh, 20 years as a public high school teacher teaching economics in United States history. When you look at the fact that 50% of the state's budget is spent on education, I think that's a good background. I also spent 19 years on the Ventura County Board of Supervisors as a supervisor, and we've been administering social service programs that the state has mandated uh, for us. Uh, when you consider that much of the rest of the state's budget is spent on social service programs and mandates to counties to implement them, I think that's a, an excellent background also uh, to represent you in the state assembly. For more than two decades, I've been a uh, local environmental leader trying to protect the natural areas and open spaces uh, in Ventura County. I've been fighting uh, for good policies to address climate change. Uh, we passed the SOAR initiatives. I was a co-author of the landmark SOAR initiatives in Ventura County. 
that stop urban sprawl from Los Angeles creeping in and, and destroying our agricultural and open space lands. It was a landmark grassroots effort, and I'm proud to have been a part of it. I've also passed laws to stop the oil industry and other polluters from polluting our air, our land, our water, and our beach water quality, um, and, and uh, ocean water. I'm acutely sensitive to uh, the growing impacts of uh, income inequality that we're having and how income inequality is growing. Uh, we need to make sure that California addresses the housing, health care, and job education requirements of people, particularly those people suffering the most from growing income inequality. I look forward to your earning your vote here with my comments Thank tonight. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Charles, we're going to start with you on our first question. And uh, we're going to talk about affordable housing. So, Charles, there's a shortage of affordable housing for our workforce, and we are seeing increased homelessness in the district. What are your solutions to these problems? And if you're elected, do you feel the legislature should make the rules, much like SB 50? Or is this a local city problem? You have one minute. Well, I believe there is a lack of housing in general, not just affordable housing. And I would believe that this would be a state level issue because if you let local level deal with that, they could just say, no, we don't want building here. We don't want to build more housing in the area. We don't want any more houses for people, low income or not. We don't want it. So I think at that point, it would be a state level issue to get more housing built. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to jump around here. Jonathan, you're next. Same question to you, though, Jonathan. Uh, one minute. Just press that one key. There we go. So Jonathan, uh, same question. There's a shortage of uh, housing for our workforce. We're seeing increased homelessness. What are your solutions? And what's your views between the legislature versus cities? Yes, how, affordable housing is one of the main issues I'm running on as a candidate. Every day, people are paying more of their incomes into rent, not being able to save to buy their own home, and it's, it's a crisis in our state. I believe that the focus should be, with the limited land we have left, the focus should be building affordable housing. I think it is something the state needs to encourage and incentivize and provide carrots to the local governments, uh, be, but there has been, in general, a in one sense, a failure to build any housing in Ventura County, which has led it to be in a recession, one of the few in the state. And in Santa Barbara, the only housing that's been built is above moderate income housing for the wealthier income earn earners. And so the people in the middle and the people at the bottom are being hurt the most by both of these policies. So I'd support uh, housing near public transportation so that people can not, be, not have to rely on their cars to get to work and a state investment in building more affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Blum, same question to you about affordable housing. OK, thanks. It's a complicated issue, hard to. What about Elsa? Okay. No, I'm sorry. He's jumping around. Are you jumping? Yeah. Yes, I am. Yeah, okay. So we'll go ahead and reset yes. those, Steve, that's so you okay. get a full. It's, that's full, OK. Full. You know, it's yeah. OK. I like to run things. Too, One minute. You know, so there we go. <laughs> He is a leader, you can tell. Um, I'll lead tonight, though, yeah. okay? So, so Stephen Bob, okay. one minute so, on housing. So as, as my friend Steve said, there, the, the wealth gap is a huge problem in this country and state, and the house, housing is, is a byproduct of it. Um, you look at the... And, and there's so many aspects of it. It's a classic case of a complicated problem. That there is no simple solution. I can't, or not, none of us could tell you in a minute or less, we'd need a couple hours to kind of go over all the ramifications. Uh, but cities and states and the state should work together to try to figure this out. It's going to take a, a multifaceted approach to figure this out so that people can live in California, that we can keep people here. I see so many of my friends who their, their children can't afford to live in Ventura, so they move out. Um, the declining enrollment in the schools because it's really hard to raise a family here. I know this, it's not we're not alone in this area, um, so it's it's one of the many issues that we need to to try to solve. Thank you, Kathy. You're up next. 
Thank you. As mayor of Santa Barbara, I have worked to create affordable housing. We have a dense housing program that has given us low income housing, medium income, and high. And um, I know what, as a state assembly member, I need to give to the cities. We need to replace the money that came from redevelopment. That was a huge funding stream that helped our housing authority build beautiful, good looking housing that serves war veterans, homeless people, or that or other subsidies. Um, if the state is gonna say build housing, then they need to provide us with some money. Um, we need to look at any surplus state land because if the, if the land costs are cheap, we can build cheaper housing. Um, SB 50, if it gave more incentives, we should give, the state should give incentives and reward instead of punishment to the local communities so that they can build what they want to build in their city. It has to look like their city and it has to fit in and serve the people. Thank, Thank you. you. Steve Bennett, you're up. We won't address the affordable housing crisis we have in California if the state and the cities start to go to war with each other. Um, there has to be a real partnership between the states and the cities for something as complicated as this. The focus that I will bring to the state legislature is one that's informed by uh, more than 20 years dealing with SOAR. We've always had to say if we're not going to build on the ag land and the open space, we have to build affordable housing in the existing urban areas. So it's been a topic that I've been focused on and trying to advance for the last 20 years. I'm proud that the Board of Supervisors approved farm worker housing uh, specifically. Uh, we just approved a, a homeless shelter where we partnered with the city of Ventura. But the real message I'll take up to the legislature is we can never build enough housing if we're going to let, if, if we're not going to focus that housing on the current workforce that we have that needs that housing. You can't build the housing, then have a bunch of people move to Santa Barbara and bid the price thank, right thank back you, Steve. up. Thank you. Elsa, same question to you. There's a shortage of affordable housing for our workforce, and we're seeing increased homelessness. What are your solutions to these problems, and what's your views about the legislature versus the cities? So I see that we need to be have a partnership between federal, state, and local government. Uh, we need to balance our needs for uh, affordable housing and housing in general with uh, environmental impacts. Um, we are more and continue to see effects of climate change, and so we need to figure out um, what those areas are that we're going to build. We can't build all the way to the coast, rising sea levels. We can't build in the urban wildlife interface. We can't get resources or have a hard time getting fire resources up there. We can't build in the floodplain. So that knocks out a bunch of areas where we can uh, build. So I'm, I would be for higher density housing. The other thing in relation to homelessness, you brought this up, and that is that we cannot continue to treat homelessness with one yardstick. There are various reasons why people are homeless. Some domestic violence, some issues of poverty. I have some to stop you there, Elsa. Yes. Jason, uh, Jason, we'll wrap up with you. Campaign, finance, reform. This is what's driving the policy in Sacramento, and this is why we need to keep local control. But even local control, we need campaign finance reform. My opponent routinely takes money from developers, even when they have projects in front of council. 7-Eleven North Milpas is a prime example. She took money from that developer and then voted on it. Um, no, no, there's four focus. things we need focus. to talk about. Focus. I can't talk about people's voting records? We're not supposed to be negative. Just <laughs> I wasn't being negative. I'm, I'm proud that there's a difference between, between her and I. We ask uh, you to emphasize your qualities. The, uh, the, yeah. This is what it comes down to, how people vote. Again, anyone can pay lip service and say they fought for affordable housing. I've actually done it. I introduced inclusionary housing in 2016 with my uh, colleague, Bendy White. I won't say who opposed it. Uh, and then I had to create a housing task force, and that's how we got inclusionary housing. I pushed for 15%. I had four council votes for it. Uh, someone else wanted 10%, and that's where we ended up. Have to these, stop these, are, these are facts. Jason, that's it on Thank that you. one. But Jason, since we're w with you on that question, let's go ahead and start with you on the next one. So candidates, this will be for all of you, a uh, little bit of uh, background. So over the last few years, this district has experienced significant drought, intense fires, disastrous debris flows, water shortage, and some sea level rise. Many of these are exacerbated by climate change. 
If you were elected, what are your priorities to help protect our coastal communities from the effects of global climate change? Well, let's start and end with me. I'm, I'm the uh, Berkeley-trained environmental lawyer who's fought for environmental justice for farm workers. Uh, I pushed for community choice energy. We would have had it January 1st in Santa Barbara, but again, someone had a different vote on that. I pushed for sustainability goals, for PACE, uh, for inclusionary housing, which reduces greenhouse gases because people can actually live in Santa Barbara, not have to drive in from out of the county. I push for mobile home protections, again, to keep people locally. We've experienced the worst gentrification in Santa Barbara. I think you need to ask yourself, if you live in, in one of these cities, are you better off now than you were two years ago? And what are some of the policies that are being driven? Tahigua's resource recovery project, again, different votes, night and day. I voted against it because it didn't do anything to eliminate single-use plastics. It doubled down on recycling, which is a dead letter now. We said, we're going to add more trash to, he to Higuas. To me, that was an automatic stop. Um, we gave away $250,000 to a marketing to contractor. That should have gone into environmental Jay justice. Jason, going to have to stop you. Sorry, just keep an eye on the timer. So uh, Elsa, same question to you. If you're elected, what are your priorities to help protect our coastal communities from the effects of climate change? I support SB 100 by uh, Senator Kevin DeLeon. Um, I'm in support of reducing greenhouse gases. And what that means, or one of the things that it means, is that we need to rethink the way that we do transportation in our area. We need a regional approach. We also need a way to make sure that we transition away from fossil fuel and into uh, renewable energy. And we need to do that at various levels, personal, commercial uh, vehicles, as well as those used for other reasons. Uh, I would be someone who will, will hold us accountable to make sure that we are moving toward those goals for 2045. Thank you. Kathy, we're going to come to you next for the, your position about climate change. Thank you. Climate change is the most a pressing environmental crisis uh, of our lifetimes. At the same time that we have to adapt to the change, sea level rise, for instance, we have to stop what's creating this situation. Um, I'd like to highlight two things that I've done already. As a member of SBCAG, the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments, I'm helping to implement SB 375, and that's where we're working with local communities to change people's behaviors, specifically help them stop using their car so much. And we uh, have an emphasis on um, Spanish outreach. The other project I'm doing is actually a project with the League of Women Voters and SBCAG and the Air Pollution Control District. It's a housing project where we will stop people needing to commute. So it's going to be a housing project near a commercial center. I also approve of the governor's $12 billion in his recently released budget to address climate resiliency. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Blum, same question. Do you need Thank me to repeat it? No, I think I can remember it. Okay. Uh, I'm old, but I still have a little bit of a memory. Right. Um, the the uh, climate change is, is, you know, what a problem. We, we're, we're all aware of it in this area, obviously, and it's created a host of other problems. To me, it is our biggest problem because if we don't solve it, all the other problems will go away because we won't be here. Um, and so we need to attack this issue from many different angles. Um, we need to um, fix the environment so that it's I don't want to be the generation that leaves our kids and grandkids with an unlivable planet. We need to fix it for ourselves and for future generations. Um, and California has been a leader, and it needs to continue to be a leader um, in the state, in the in the country, in the world. And um, I don't, I can't think of a problem that's more pressing. Thank you, Charles. We'll go to you. Your thoughts. Um, my thoughts on climate change is. The climate has always changed, and it will continue to always change, regardless of if you try to mitigate it through policy or anything like that. It, it, the cli climate changes. That's why we have fossils of palm trees and rainforests in the desert in the Sahara. Uh, yeah, that's what happens. Now, to help fix the area around here, the sea level rise, 
the sea levels rise, they're going to rise and fall regardless. They were 450 feet lower than they were today in the last ice age. It's going to rise to mitigate that. You either need to move farther away from the ocean or add sand or more land. I don't, I don't know what to do. There's a lot of things that need okay. to be discussed about thank, that. Thank you. Steve Bennett, you're up next on climate change. Thank you very much. Tough topics to do in one minute. Um, but climate change is the quintessential threat to all of us right now, and we have to take it uh, extremely seriously. Uh, it's such a, an important threat that when the Sierra Club was doing their endorsements and interviewing the candidates, it was probably the major issue that they focused on. And so uh, since I only have a minute, I'll just tell you that I'm really proud of the fact that after the interviews of the seven candidates, the Sierra Club uh, gave me their sole endorsement um, and uh, recommendation to, for, uh, voting for voting for me uh, for the 37th Assembly District. Uh, with regards to specific things, uh, I... Uh, have been able to end the flaring of gas on all new oil wells down in Ventura County. And that's a county where the oil industry is really powerful. Uh, and I also worked with Salud Carbajal when he was a supervisor to push Cycle California Coast, which was to increase bicycling in our counties. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Jonathan, we'll wrap up with you. Thank you. Climate change is an existential threat to the future of humanity. People my age are thinking of not even having kids because they don't want them to grow up in a world that's destroyed by climate change. So it's deeply personal to me. One thing that a lot of people don't know, it's new information, is that Santa Barbara and Ventura counties are ground zero for climate change. We have the most warming in the entire United States here in Santa Barbara and Ventura, 2.3 degrees Celsius and 2.6 in Ventura. I support a Green New Deal in California as a strategic plan and funding system to, to get our communities to move away from the climate emissions that are, that are hurting our planet. I support an end to any new fossil fuel permits from being approved in the state of California. We don't need any more oil and gas projects in our state. I support a move to publicly owned utilities so that we can manage our own energy at the public level instead of leaving it up to for-profit monopolies to control our energy and hurt our climate. And I, I met with Forest Watch about a $1 billion fire resiliency project. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, we'll start with you on the uh, next question. We're going to shift over to the economy. Let's talk about innovation and jobs. So, Jonathan, there are those who say that businesses are leaving the state due to costly regulations, the high cost of living, and tax policy. If you're elected, what will be your action steps to encourage innovation and create jobs in our communities? Thank you for the question. I've, I've not experienced this. I took a master's in technology management program where we had 40 of my peers all with their own ideas of new companies they wanted to build here in California. And so I think education is the first uh, step we take to encourage job creation. Right now, there's people graduating with $30,000 plus of student debt on a yearly basis. And that's holding back people's abilities to have the freedom they need to take a chance. We don't have a single-payer health care system in this state, so people rely on being an employee to another company instead of going off and starting their own business. Things like that, social safety nets, tuition-free public colleges to allow people to reach their potential, single-payer health care to give people their freedom and security to have health care without relying on an employer. Those are the things we do to give people their basic security so that they can go on and innovate on their own and come up with businesses that will help our state thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Bennett, same question to you. If you're elected, what will be your action steps to encourage innovation and create jobs? We, we have been facing uh, this job crisis and this job scenario for the last 20 years in Ventura County, as, as everybody has in uh, Southern California. There is a shortage of highly skilled, trained people. And as Jonathan said, the first thing we need to do is workforce development. We have many employees, I mean employers, who want to locate in Ventura County, but they say they can't find enough trained workers. Uh, I am uh, proud of the fact that the Ventura County Board of Supervisors has worked closely with the Workforce Investment Board on training, and 
working with the businesses. So we bring the businesses in, we find out what are the skills that need to be uh, promoted in Ventura County. We recently set up an academy for nurse training. We set up academies for machinist training. Uh, those are the things that we have to do, get our workforce trained so that those top businesses feel comfortable locating here. Great if you're technology trained, not if you have any other skills. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Jason, same question to you. We need tax reform and we need to encourage businesses. We need to spend a lot more time staying out of the way of businesses. In Santa Barbara, I've been working for the last four years to try to reform our community development department because there's a, a reputation that they're not helping businesses in Santa Barbara. We also need to knock off this environment versus the economy, false dichotomy. I wrote a resolution and my colleagues helped me pass it in Santa Barbara. 85 other cities have joined me in that resolution. Oxnard was a recent city to join that encouraged high tech jobs in the energy field. So we can have people transfer from fossil fuels over. Uh, I've sparked it myself by owning an electric vehicle. Um, education, I've taught for 10 years, started teaching in high school. I've taught at the local law school, taught at a few other law schools. Pittsburgh followed the model of education, the arts, and healthcare to come out of its fossil fuel economy. We can do the same thing. Education jobs are high paying and they increase the value of the consumer, the student, at the end of the, the cycle. Thank you. Charles, same question to you. If you're elected, what will be your action steps to encourage innovation and create jobs? Well, first of all, you need to lower the taxes so the businesses don't just move off to Texas like they've been doing for the past 50 years. Uh, second, you need a work training program so you have enough people available to fill the jobs that are here so we don't get people from outside to come and work those jobs. And we just generally need to be more business friendly in this state. Thank you. Thank you. Elsa, same question to you, please. So... People in the fossil fuel industry are afraid of losing their jobs because they're high paying, they're good paying with good benefits. And so I think that we need to help with a transition to green jobs. They're also scared of losing jobs to automation. And um, we can uh, take all of the, the, any savings that we have in um, current jobs, fossil fuel automation, and use it to retrain workers, to provide them with greater skills, to provide them with education. Um, I um, have a sister who worked in early childhood education. She was given the opportunity to attend college in order to improve her skills. Everyone in that field across the state was given that opportunity, and so many people took it up, and they now are in better paying jobs to support their families Thank you. Kathy, let's hear your thoughts. Thank you. I'll work with the universities and educational institutions in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties uh, to encourage entrepreneurship, uh, creating uh, innovation and, and high-tech, good-paying jobs. Um, I'd like to focus on agriculture. That's a big part of uh, Ventura County and our region uh, to promote carbon farming and make um, agriculture more sustainable. There's a lot of pressures on agriculture. We'll need that local food production as the climate gets more disrupted. Um, and agriculture is a big part of the local economy. I would work with our economic development collaboratives in the area to find investors and social venture partners to make investments in these kinds of programs. It'll create uh, good jobs for people and save our environment. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Blum, we'll wrap up with you. Thank you. Um, I think it's kind of a myth that all of these businesses are leaving California. Um, some are leaving, some are coming, and most are staying. California is a paradise. People want to come here, and, and so do businesses. Um, affordable housing is a problem. A lot of businesses and, and companies, they can't, their workers can't afford to live here, or, and they certainly can't afford to move here if you... Um, because of our housing prices and, and, and rent prices. Um, but we need to keep our roaring economy going. California, as you know, is the would be the fifth um, largest economy in the world if it was a country. So when they say business is not doing good here, it's preposterous. Um, but we need to keep that going. We need to be friendly to business and make sure that they're able to prosper. 
Um, and the community colleges have done, they keep trying to address the, the, um, the new jobs of the future, and it's, it's something that I've had some experience with as well. Thank you. Elsa, we're going to start the next question with you. Certainly one of the areas that the California legislature is in charge of is education and funding of it. Elsa, what are your views on community colleges regarding career training and transfer to the universities? And also, do you support free or low-cost higher education? First of all, let me say that one of my endorsers is a former uh, superintendent of public instruction, Delane Easton. And Delane pointed out something to me in the California Constitution, and that is that we have a mandate to fund education first, and we're not doing it. We're uh, uh, just letting a special interest bully us to not do that. So I am someone who is in support of that, someone who will fight for education, someone who will support uh, community college as a place for training and information and um, upgrading skills. I am in support of uh, accessible cost to education or and or free education until we get there. Thank you. Kathy, we'll come to you next. What was the second part so of the question? So the question is, what are your views on community colleges regarding career training and transfers to universities? And do you support free or low-cost higher education? Obviously, that costs money to do that. Yes, I do support affordable education or low-cost education. I'm really proud that the governor's budget includes $6 billion for higher education this year, uh, $2 billion for UC, $2 billion for Cal State, and $2 billion for community colleges. It's a wonderful place uh, to learn how to be a nurse. Uh, the educational programs, the job training programs are, are wonderful. Um, we need to increase enrollment in our community colleges, maybe build some more, and increase the grant opportunities for disadvantaged students. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Bennett, same question to you, please. You know, the rest of the world uh, is able to provide, the rest of the uh, industrialized modern world is able to provide free university education. And yet here we are, the United States, and somehow we're not able to pull that off. Um, that's not because it can't be done, but it's because we've made different value choices. So my first answer to your question, yes, I support uh, low or free um, uh, training, uh, university training and community college training that's out there. The second thing is we have to uh, focus our energies on making each young person <laughs> as productive as they can possibly be. Uh, I'm really proud of the fact that the California Teachers Association interviewed the, all of the candidates and uh, they are the largest educational organization in the state and they've endorsed my candidacy. And I hope that we can become like Norway and um, have a huge number of people that are working. Uh, ran thank, out of time thank, on you, thank you, Steve. OK, Jason, uh, your thoughts, please, on higher education. So I've, I've taken classes at five different community colleges, including Cerritos College in LA, where I took classes when I was in high school, which led me to fall in love with psychology, which was my major in college. So I'm a very strong supporter of community colleges. Um, I think people should pay according to their ability. I'm not going to pay for Bezos's kids' education. You need transparency. People should know what they're getting out of a college. There's too many colleges out there who are ripping off kids. And, and you shouldn't have to pay for those colleges to rip off kids. My alma mater pays for students who can't, and that's voluntary, and we should encourage institutions to, to do that. But we shouldn't take from the poor to give to the rich, so I'm against that. And regarding jobs, uh, Fred Shaw, who's a council member here in CARP, he can tell you where Carl's Juniors used to be. Is it a block away? So we do lose companies out of state. I think they got a good deal when Procore moved in. <laughs> so that's what we need to encourage is, is tech jobs. And we need to encourage students at these institutions to take tech classes. And all students, unfortunately, you're not seeing that diversity being thank, shared. Thank you, Jason. OK, Stephen Blum, same question to you. Um, yes, I, I've spent 40 plus years in public education, so I'm obviously a big supporter of it. I um, spent 12 years on the community college board, and I'm a big um, proponent of the community college system, the low cost education that it offers, the career training, as well as the the um, transfer ability to get your transfer units. 
um, and then go on to a four-year school. So the state has been making movement, and that's a good thing, to make it easier for students to move from the community college to the um, university without, uh, in a seamless manner. Um, I support low-cost education. Um, as I said before, California is the greatest state in the country and the, in the greatest country in the world, and that's because of our public education system, not in spite of it. So I've always been a huge supporter of public education. If elected, I would continue to do so and really cast aspersion on those who call it a failing public school because they're wrong. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Uh, we'll go to Jonathan next. Same question. Thank you. My favorite question. Is my microphone? Oh, yeah. there it is. In 1960, California made a promise to the people of this state that you were entitled to a free, high-quality, and accessible education to everybody. And we broke that promise in 1970. It used to be free to go to college for 100 years in our state. And Governor Ronald Reagan undid that. I'm running to bring that back. I've been working on this for the last 10 years. I've been the head of a statewide coalition, the Reclaimed California Higher Education Coalition, working to bring back tuition-free college to California, and also going further to funding the cuts that have been made to our education system, and then also funding the new seats that we want to see there, because that's not usually done. There's a lot of ways to do it, and a state tax on the wealthiest people passing down their wealth would raise the $5 billion needed to eliminate tuition in California. There's other proposals. I also worked as a community college trustee to try to partner with our high schools to provide and extend a career technical education. Thank you. Thank you. Charles, we'll wrap up with you on higher education. Uh, well, everyone's saying free college. Let's, let's be honest here. It's not going to be free. There is going, it's not. There is going to be an increase in tax. There is going to be an increase in spending. I paid my way for all the classes that I took at college. I worked my butt off for it. And it's... I. I think everyone else should create a work ethic and pay their way through college as well. That's me personally. I know some people can actually do that, but that's what scholarships are for. My friend, he can't afford college on his own. He, he got a scholarship, so he's still paying for it. And as well, I think for the jobs, I think we should put more time into vocational training and jobs like that. Like mechanic, mechanics, plumbers, all the vocational stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Blum, we're going to start with you on this next question. Uh -huh. Certainly homelessness on many public polls is uh, ranked very high by people of California, their concerns. Um, mental health is a component of that, but certainly not the only reason for homelessness. So clearly mental health and homelessness, they're not simply local issues. What is your view on the role of the legislature to deal with these problems? And do you have any real policies that you're going to advocate for to solve these problems? Um, OK. It was nice not going first. You had more time to think. Um, <laughs> the, it's another of the many issues that we're facing. Um, mental health is a big part of it. Like I told you before, I defend mentally ill um, clients at, at this from the state hospitals at Atascadero and, and Patton most of them a good percentage of them were homeless and a mental illness is a big part of it and you and there's other parts too we don't have time to go over them all but it's certainly something that it's an issue it needs to be solved it's not going to be solved by one person or anybody at this dais if it was a simple solution it would already be solved uh, we wouldn't have to think of it um, but it needs, again, like so many other issues, a multifaceted um, group think and solution because it's not just going to go away. It's, it's been getting worse and, and getting worse fast. Thank you. Jonathan, you're up next, please. Thank you. One thing people don't know is that most people experiencing homelessness used to be renters in the county they're homeless. And so housing and affordability of housing is, I think, the number one thing we need to do to combat homelessness because we shouldn't even have people becoming homeless in the first place. Next step is in terms of mental health, again, not to rag too much on our former governor, but I think he deserves a lot of blame. As the president, he shut down the mental health system that I think had a lot of flaws and I think we need to reinstitute something that's humane, but also really taking care of people. I support the policy of housing first to get people housed 
and then the services they need because you're not going to really help somebody while they're still living on the street and struggling. And finally, I want to highlight a program that we do at my agency, the Isla Vista Community Services District called Isla Vista Beautiful with the United Way, where we employ people experiencing homelessness to clean up our town, and that gets them an income and on their feet to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Charles, same question to you. Well, as, as you said, uh, focus on housing. We need to build more housing so we can actually house these people. And then job training would also have an effect for the people who are able to work and give them a source of income. And then for the mental health aspect, we shut down all the mental health facilities in California. That is ridiculous to me. Why would we do this? These people need help, and we shut down their only option to get it. I believe we should bring it back and help these people. But as Stephen said, it's a multifaceted issue. There is not just one answer, and I would be happy to work with anybody, Democrat or Republican or Independent, to get this done. Thank you. Steve Bennett, so same question as far as clearly mental health and homelessness are not simply local issues. What is your view on the role of the legislature to deal with these problems and what policies would you advocate? Well, with the recognition that it is a complex problem, op opioid crisis, growing income inequality, mental health, you have to have all of the various government agencies come together. So I'm going to use my time to quickly tell you what we did in the county of Ventura to try to partner with our cities. Um, first, a uh, number of years ago, uh, Supervisor Kathy Long and myself said we would match 50% of the cost of building a homeless shelter uh, with, with any city that wanted to do that. No city took us up on it. A few years later, we said we'd do 50% of the cost of building it and 50% of the operation and maintenance of a homeless shelter. Nobody took us up on it. I'm really proud that just last week we opened our first homeless shelter in the city of Ventura because we did the third thing. We actually found the site for them because they had so much nimbyism when it came to locating a homeless shelter uh, that they couldn't do it. But using county property, we were able to overcome that, uh, and we opened that homeless shelter. Homeless shelter is just one way, but you have to have a whole continuum of care to get somebody out of homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy, let's hear your thoughts, please. Homeless is, homelessness is a national crisis, and we do need the federal government to participate, specifically the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which used to build low-income housing. They've stopped. When we change leadership in the White House, let's change that. Let's have the federal government start building some more housing. Um, the state of California is responding. Um, the legislature passed the Medi-Cal Healthier California for All initiative, which is a way to transform the Medi-Cal system to be more responsive to homeless people and specifically people with mental illness. So the uh, state's forming a task force and they're looking at behavioral health parity laws, meaning that the insurance companies have to pay as much to provide adequate coverage for mental health services and treatment. We need more beds, we need more treatment. If we build housing, it has to have supportive services and that includes mental health treatment. Thank you, Jason, same question, please. Speaking of insanity, it's doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Stop electing the same people from the same tribe who aren't producing results. It doesn't go back to Reagan. The public health facility, Puff in Santa Barbara, has had four beds for, for 20 years since Shane Stark was county council in Santa Barbara County, and he hired me to come up here in 2001. You got to elect people who get results, who understand the issues. I have a, a degree in psychology. I convened a psych psychology in the law conference. I worked for the county. One of the things I did was I went into court and did uh, commitment hearings. So I understand the law. California needs to change the standard for commitments. And it's had several proposals. None of them have had traction. I'm going to go to Sacramento for you and make sure these laws get pushed through. The homelessness comes down to mental health, drug and alcohol addiction, and our very harsh economy on the middle class. And it's getting harsher because of the lack of campaign, finance, reform. That's how we're going to change our economy, because right now special interests are ruling the day. Thank you. Elsa, we'll wrap up with you, please. Thank you. I agree that uh, it's a national crisis, and we've left it to local government and nonprofits to deal with it. 
uh, we need a federal, state, and local government uh, partnership along with our nonprofits who can provide additional support services, not just a home. I'm glad that Governor Newsom is visiting LA and trying to figure out what to do about homelessness there as well as uh, San Francisco. But to be honest, we need a plan. We need a plan that extends from Siskiyou County all the way to San Diego County. And that plan needs to include something that looks at the various reasons why people are homeless. We can't use the same, um, th the same solution to each of the different reasons why people are homeless. I, like I said before, some have to do with poverty, so we have to address poverty. Some have to do with domestic violence. I very well know that because I run a program that thank, thank is you, in Elsa. that. Don't forget to vote March 3rd. And your uh, absentee ballots uh, are going out now. So the election's right around the corner. We're going to begin with questions from the audience. Charles, you're up first on the question. And this first one is, child care costs are astronomical. What are your thoughts on universal child care? <laughs> I, uh, I was one of the uh, smart start kids. I, I was a after school child care uh, product. I, so I, I do believe that there should be care for children whose parents can't pick them up right after school. They should have somewhere they should be able to go. But once again, it, it, you, you can't call it free. There is always going to be someone paying for that. But I do believe there should be something helping the children whose parents can't always be there for them. But I would prefer for the parents to be there instead. Thank you. Jonathan, same question to you. Child care costs are astronomical. What are your thoughts on universal child care? And I believe the question is probably not just education, but preschool as well. Thank you for the question. This has been a part of my platform since I decided to run. It's part of my platform of making education a lifelong right. Starting with paid parental leave, moving on to universal child care, having pre-K in California, which is not currently provided universally, and then moving on forward. I think it's such a root issue for working families, especially single women, to provide the benefit of universal child care so that people can be able to go to work and have that peace of mind that their child's being taken care of. It's so important because you could either not work and then you lose that income, or you have to pay huge sums of money just to find somewhere to go. And so I think universal pre-K takes that year off, so the kid's already going to school then, and having child care in those intervening years is just important to make sure that everybody has access to that and it also creates jobs so when you provide universal child care those are jobs that are being created that people can fill and we can all support each other together thank you thank you Stephen Blum same question oh, yeah this is uh, you guys are asking some hard questions um, but anyway reminder to vote to donate to the League of Women Voters <laughs> I'm not quite sure what you, when you say universal child care, whether that means from birth or whatever, um, but we need to be able to help people that need it. Um, we have two with ch high, high child cost care and housing, and we've incentivized people not to work. Um, a minimum wage earner can pay easily 100% of their income for child care for two or three um, children, and, and obviously it's it's not a good thing. We need to incentivize people to work instead of the opposite. And I, I've talked to people, they just, they tell me they're on the, they're on welfare and they go, I can't afford to work. Um, and we need to make that not the case. Thank you, Kathy. Same question. Thank you. I support universal child care. Um, it's a women's empowerment issue. Both parents should be able to uh, earn a living and have fulfilling careers. Um, Infant care is essential, too. Um, preschool is important, uh, should be part of the whole package to uh, get our kids ready for school, especially the English learners. I also believe in strong after-school programs uh, that's more than just daycare. It's uh, cultural enrichment, 
homework help, sports so that kids stay healthy and have something to do uh, after school. I'm proud of Monique Lamon, our assembly member, who passed a bill to unionize uh, child care workers. They're some of the lowest paid uh, people uh, in our economy, and what's good for them is good for our, our families. Thank you for such a good question. Thank you. Steve Bennett, same question. I support uh, universal child care. I spent four years on our first five commission in Ventura County. And uh, what you learn when you're working in first five is that the most productive investment our society can make is in young children. Uh, the younger they are, the more productive the investment. The brain is still forming and forming more rapidly at that point in time. That's the reason why First Five is one of the very few programs that there's actual bipartisan support in this country for. And uh, we can easily uh, make that happen if we change our priorities uh, here in this country and, and here in California. Um, I wanted to... Uh, emphasize, I wanted to finish up my comment about Norway. Norway, the number one goal of government there is to try to make every person as productive as possible. And consequently, they invest and they view this early time as really essential. But they have 82% of the adult workforce working. We're at about 60%. It's because they make them productive. Thank, Thank you. you. And Elsa Granados, same question to you. So we often hear people say, the youth are our future. And everybody says, yay, they clap for that. And yes, they are. Well, if that's true, then we need to invest in them as such. Um, I, I support universal child care, because it, especially because it disproportionately affects women. And what we know is that when we invest in women, we increase the well-being of a community. And I want to see our communities thrive. Um, I also support investing uh, greater funds into early childhood education salaries and benefits, because many people shy away from uh, those jobs because of, the, of what they pay. And yet, these are the people that we've entrusted to educate and care for our children. So I support that. Thank you. And we'll uh, go on next to Jason. So um, I'm learning a lot about child care. <laughs> As many of you know, my wife uh, gave birth. Uh, we had the last baby of the decade about 35 days ago, uh, New Year's Eve, around 5 o'clock. And so we've, for the last year since, since we became pregnant, we've been looking at child care and wondering how the heck are we going to pay for this in, in a county where the wages are so uh, desperate from the costs. We're the third poorest county in the state. So it's definitely an issue for single parents, which is predominantly single moms, and it leads to a cycle of poverty. So we need, to, we need to stop that cycle. This is the single most important thing we can do to stop this cycle and support these single parents and all parents. Who knows, uh, Emmeline, we hope that she grows up. My wife was a cancer researcher, worked on stem cell transplants, and treated multiple myeloma patients. Maybe one of these, these kids who comes out of universal child care will end up curing cancer. So I think we've had universal agreement on this issue, so universal child care it is. Thank you. And Jonathan, we'll start with you on the next question. Given the lack of local support for SB 50, how would you increase housing in areas like Carpinteria or Ventura without encroaching on ag land or view sheds? How would you solve the puzzle? Yes, it's, it is quite the puzzle. I think there's a couple things that need to be done. I think something like SB 50, but for nonprofit housing developers where we're focusing on affordable housing and not on big developers who are trying to make a huge profit, I think that would be something that a lot of people can agree on is let's incentivize the development of housing, but let's benefit the nonprofit housing developers, which there are many of in our community even. I think another thing we can do is there's still market rate housing being built in the city of Santa Barbara and other areas. There should be a statewide requirement for inclusionary housing like uh, Jason got done at the city of Santa Barbara, that should be a statewide requirement for all market rate housing projects that are built. So those are some of some ideas. And at the end of the day, housing needs to be built and housing needs to be built near transit. So those were very good ideas as a part of SB 50. It just didn't go about it in the right way. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Bennett, same question to you about how would you increase housing in areas like Carpinteria and Ventura without encroaching on ag land or view sheds? First, as I 
when we talked about housing before, I ended by saying we have to build for our local residents. We can't put people in competition with newcomers coming in from outside the state. So one, at the state level, I would focus on trying to make it easier and more legal to actually build housing for local identified residents. I think that does two things. One, um, it really dramatically decreases um, the opposition. People are more willing to say yes for the for the students of the carpentry, I mean, for the teachers of the carpentry of school district and for the clerical workers, yeah, we'll, we'll take this housing in this area. Second thing I would emphasize is that land trust are, I think, the way for us to go. And that is where government agencies and nonprofits buy the land, build affordable housing on it, sell the housing, but they maintain the ownership of the land. So you, the owner gets some appreciation, but later there's a formula, they sell the house, and it goes to somebody else that is also qualifies low income. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jason, same question to you, please. So there's a whole host of solutions. There's not one silver bullet. And, and like my former colleague, Mayor Mario said, it's when we lost redevelopment, that was a huge blow to cities. So that's something that I'd want to put back on the table in Sacramento. Uh, like M Mr. Bennett said, land trust, that's a great tool. Co-ops, we have two co-ops on the east side near where I live. Let's encourage co-ops, particularly if you combine them with land trusts. Um, let's strip away regulations. When AUD passed in Santa Barbara, it had the perverse impact of raising property values, which is one of the four major inputs to housing. Another perverse impact is we actually demolished below market rate housing to make way for new housing. And so those new housing units came in above market rate, like the mark, and uh, we got rid of, there's a bunch of units on Haley Street that were getting rid of these cute little blue cottages that when the replacement goes in, it's gonna be cost, costing three times as much. So we gotta stop shooting ourselves in the foot. Thank you. Charles, let's hear your thoughts about how you would increase housing in areas like Carpinteria and Ventura without encroaching on ag land or view sheds. Reduce regulation for the actual building of housing. Uh, streamline the permitting process. And uh, let people decide what to do with their own property. I am a big believer in personal property and property rights of the individual. And I would like to uh, keep it that way. If someone wants to build affordable housing on their property and have that, sure, great. If someone wants to build a house... Sure, great. If someone wants to build rentals all over, great. We'll have more housing and make it for the people who live in the city or the, or the county. I think uh, we need to focus more on the people in the state than the people out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Elsa, same question to you. Well, I want to make sure that Carpinteria and Ventura have a greater say in what kind of housing and how much housing gets built. Because um, we need to balance our need for housing with our environmental concerns. I think all of us agree that we need more housing. But it wasn't that long ago that Kachuma Lake was at dangerously low levels. We will continue to see those effects. Last year we had a wet winter, this one not so much. And so we need to balance that with, are we gonna have enough clean water for the people who are living in the new development? Are we gonna have enough water to fight those fires in the extension of the fire season? So I want to, yes, absolutely, we need to build more housing for our firefighters, um, teachers, and small business owners, but we also need to make sure we have enough natural resources. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, the solution is infill development with as much density as the community can bear. A community should bring together all the stakeholders, large employers, small business owners, electeds, the faith community, residents, millennials, and come to an agreement, a location, a map where um, the housing makes sense, where it's along a transportation corridor. You can't talk about housing without talking about transportation because people need to get to their jobs, to their school. Uh, height is a really big issue. I'm looking out at some Carpentarians here. Three stories high is shocking to some people. Oh, high. 
people are used to one story, and so they really need to work on a plan about where that housing would go. Um, the state does need to provide subsidies or land, and the accessory dwelling unit uh, law is a good solution. Um, you can build a second unit. Gonna have to stop here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Steve, Stephen Blum. Okay, everything I wrote down has already been said, but uh, so this is gonna be repetitory. Um, but um, obviously, Senate Bill 50 didn't pass. There was too many things that people didn't like about it. Um, one of the big ones was that cities didn't like losing local control. Nobody likes to to give that up. So the state needs to go back to the drawing board because it is a state and local issue. Um, I, parts of it, you know, like the, the notion that every city should build X amount. Well, some cities, as it's been said, they don't have the capacity to build as many places as some other cities that have a lot of more unused land. Um, you know, yeah, the upzoning in, in the infill, um, smaller housing, even even things like mobile home parks um, are, are things that can be done. And there are certainly many others to provide more uh, affordable housing, but it, it really needs to be a priority. But then like every other solution, the, what other Thank problems you. is it causing? Thank you. Okay, I think you're all gonna love this next question. We're gonna learn about you, learn about your history. And we're gonna start with Jason. So the question from the audience, can each of you speak to how you have mentored, hired, or otherwise helped advance the goals of women in your sphere of influence? So Jason, share with us your background in that area. So uh, I've led two nonprofits in the recent years, and I think um, there were about eight hires that I made, and seven of them were women, including promoting uh, a woman to run the Legal Aid Foundation office in Santa Barbara. Jennifer Smith, and uh, Julia Lara is someone who I've, I've, uh, I was her official intern host. She was, uh, she's a master's of social work student at Cal State Northridge, so I hosted her. And so those are examples. Um, I've always been very forward-looking. I'm, I'm happy to say I received 100% rating from Planned Parenthood. And um, I'm really looking forward to mentoring Emmeline, my daughter, and just being a teacher for 10 years, really promoting the career interests of women in my classroom and, and knowing that, particularly with my law school students, it's still not a very diverse world out there and coaching them on how they can deal with some of those cultural differences and still be successful. Thank you. Elsa, what are your, what's your experience in this area? So I work at Standing Together to End Sexual Assault and many young women come to volunteer and work there. And we um, have some formal conversations to talk about professionalism, work ethic, any number of issues that might affect someone as they are developing their career. And not only that, but um, so I build a relationship with them. And so much so that often when they leave, they call me back in their next job or next employment. And they say, I'm having this problem. Can you help me? And then I, I try to figure it out with them. The other, I was a, a woman of color chair for the state of California Rape Crisis Centers. And in that, I did the same with them. So that had rippled out across the state. It's very, very important to me that women are mentored and that we do it not only in informal ways, but in very formal ways. Thank you. Kathy, let's hear from you, please. Thank you. I've mentored women to run for political office so that they can have that ripple effect. If you have a woman in office, um, our issues will be taken seriously. I see Rose Munoz out in the audience. Um, Rose is a member of the Santa Barbara School Board, the only Spanish-speaking um, member. Thank Goodness, you got elected, Rose. So glad to support you. I offer internships in my office at City Hall mostly to young women. Um, I have a long time older woman who's been my um, intern, and right now I have a young intern college, a, a young man from a, a college a student. Um, so at City Hall, I always pressure our city administrator to hire women as department heads and in management positions. And I'm really proud that our police chief is female and almost 20% of our police force at uh, the city of Santa Barbara is female. Really proud of that. Thank, thank you. Good thank question. Thank you. Stephen Blum. 
Um, well, I coached um, track and cross country, women's track and cross country for 20 years back starting in 1980 um, when women's athletics didn't start in high schools till 1975. So it was relatively new. People kind of forget that's been around for a while, but really not that long. Um, so I mentored hundreds and hundreds of young women. Um, I'll just mention one of them who now is a cardiologist whose uncle owns a local bagel shop. So I talked to her every once in a while and warmed my heart. She told me one day, um, she, you know, that when from cross country, she learned that she could do anything. And that was exactly what I tried to instill in the young athletes, girls and boys that I coached, is that you can do anything, just just go for it. Um, and I also was the union president for 12 years. 80% um, of this, the teaching force was women, and, and uh, I spent a lot of time encouraging them to move up as well. Thank you. Charles, would you like me to reread the question, or you're good? Sure. It's about time for that. Yeah. So can each of you speak to how you have mentored, hired, or otherwise uh, helped advance the goals of women in your sphere of influence? Um. Well, as uh, someone who's never had a position of stature like these guys, uh, I can't say that I've actually done any of those uh, things that they're talking about, help promote, help assist, because I've been working on school and that kind of stuff. But absolutely, if, if they are going for their goal, I believe we should do everything in our power to help them. Same for every other person, because everyone should be able to strive for what they want to do. Thank you. Steve Bennett. I'm proud of the fact that the first female CEO of uh, Ventura County government, that's 8,000 employees, um, was somebody that we hired on a 3-2 vote, and I was one of the three that uh, decided to hire her. Uh, that was a, a real uh, ground-breaking uh, move for us in Ventura County government, and as a result, we have many women moving up now into the upper management ranks in, in, in Ventura County. Second thing, there's a girls' empowerment workshop uh, run in Ojai, and I uh, found significant funding for them, uh, and it's a wonderful workshop in terms of empowering young, uh, young girls. Uh, Carmen Ramirez on the city council in Ojai. Uh, I ran her uh, campaign when they, uh, uh, there was an effort to try to recall her uh, and uh, made sure that she was successful in terms of coming out of that. I've made it a goal of our fire department to increase the number of women uh, that are hired on the fire department. I've got a longer Thank list. You. I'm out of time. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Jonathan, we'll wrap up with you. Thank you. As a man, I recognize that it's my responsibility to do more as much as I can to in, in this area. And so I'll give you a few examples. When I was student body president at UCSB, I supported a woman to replace me because there are so few women who have even served as student body president at UCSB. One of our former interns in my office has gone on to work in the state assembly and actually helped me uh, secure assembly member Evan Lowe's endorsement. So thank you, Cassie, if she's watching. Um, as the general manager of the community services district, one weakness is that our board is mostly men. And so what I did as the executive is make sure that as we hired our staff, we now have exemplary women of color running the different parts of the community services district. And I'm proud of that. Uh, one last thing to mention, of course, is my campaign. Our Santa Barbara coordinator and our Ventura coordinator and our campaign manager are all women. And I know that that's important to me to keep me grounded to the issues and empower them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are going to start with you, Elsa, on the next question. Uh, I'm going to try to combine two here. So Santa Barbara is obviously dealing with transportation issues, the uh, issues with 101, the Montecito access and on-ramps, the possibility of roundabouts. Caltrans is involved, of course, in all of this. And these issues are true in Ventura County as well. So the question is, boiled down, the citizens and government officials of Santa Barbara and Ventura would likely be heard more directly if our state assembly person had a seat on the transportation committee. Will you, as an assembly candidate, make the transportation committee your first choice for a committee assignment if you are elected? And then what would be your second committee preference? Tell us about what other committee you would like to serve on. And we are going to begin with you, Elsa. Okay. 
So if I have the opportunity before making a commitment, I would need to take a look at what the opportunities are and also to work with my constituency to see what, which committees serve best uh, in relation to what our priorities are and what our needs are. One thing that I'm hearing from uh, voters throughout the district and in particular in the southern and eastern part of the district is that they feel ignored by legislators. They feel that they don't get enough time, they don't know them, their legislators don't listen to them, and I want to change that. I want to take some very definite steps to make sure that voters feel that they have access to myself and my office. And so I would make those decisions about committee selection in, rela in, in relation to what voter priorities are in my district. Thank you. Kathy Murillo, same question to you, please. Thank you. Um, as a member of Santa Barbara County Association of Governments, I have been overseeing the um, widening of 101 and the addition of the high occupancy um, vehicle lane. It's going to take five more years. And I know some people are not happy about the roundabouts. It was a project that was approved uh, several years ago. It underwent CEQA review. It had a CEQA challenge that went to court. So the whole thing has been adjudicated. and. I have to say, I think everyone has um, done what they can uh, on that subject. As for committees, um, I was hoping to get on a budget or budget subcommittee um, so that I could just ensure that the state is um, uh, spending uh, in a prudent manner and making sure that we get our fair share here in this district. Um, I was told a water committee is good too because the water bo bond uh, monies um, w would come to our area. So. Those were my two. Thanks for giving me the idea about the Transportation Committee. I'll, I'll look into that. Thank you. Steve Bennett, same question, please. Pretty easy for me. The Natural Resources Committee and, and the Water Committee. Uh, we are uh, really faced, and I've, I've served for many years on the uh, Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Basin, which manages uh, the freshwater aquifer under the Oxnard Plain, a huge resource for us in Ventura County. Uh, there are so many issues about water, and I've uh, uh, spent 20 years working on water issues, uh, and so I would uh, think I would bring uh, some, some real uh, background uh, to both that water issue and the Natural Resources Committee. It would be my two first choices. Uh, but but uh, I, I don't think the speaker's going to sit there and just give us all of our first choices, but we'll, it'll be interesting to see. Thank you. Jason, same question to you, please. Yeah, I'm going to go up there and, and talk to leadership in Sacramento and say, what is it that my particular background lends itself to you? Is, is it the environmental law degree? I have a very different idea about transportation. I think widening the freeway in and of itself, just doing that was a bad idea. And I like roundabouts. So again, here's a clear contrast between me and other folks up here. It's a 19th century solution to a 21st century problem. It just adds double the greenhouse gases. And it may provide temporary relief, particularly if you're in carpentry and you're stuck between commuters going one way or the other. But once you widen the freeway and more and more people start commuting because it's an equilibrium. There's an axiom, vehicle miles traveled, VMT, increase proportionally to the size of the freeway. So when you add lanes, you're just gonna get more cars out there until that time of commute gets back up there and people stop commuting. It's the time of the commute that stops people from that commute. So when there's jobs in Santa Barbara and people live in Ventura and it's only a 20 minute commute, they're gonna take the freeway and that commute's gonna shoot back up. So we should have encouraged electric buses, we should that, have encouraged you, train. Jason, thank you. Sorry, that time runs out quick, doesn't it? It does. Okay, Steve Plum, same question to you about transportation and other committees. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind being on the transportation committee, but Steve kind of already mentioned that if you if one of us obviously is going to get elected and, and will be a rookie, and they'll put you on the committees that that you know that you get put on. Um, myself, um, the, the uh, education and social services and and the penal system are the things that I know most about. There's there's so many things that you're supposed to know about, and no one person can know all those things. Um, but those three things are about 80 or 90 percent of the state budget. Um, so, but um, as far as transportation goes, it's already been mentioned. You know, it, it's it's a problem and it's going to continue to be a problem. And and the one solution it causes another. If we build these houses and these affordable houses that we're talking about, well, yeah, there's going to be more traffic. So people need to think ahead of time and forward instead of solving the problems after they're already there. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. 
Yes, so I'm not going to commit to committees yet, but I will say that transportation is one of the issues that a lot of voters have talked to me about. For example, when my mom and I canvass in Santa Paula and Fillmore, one of the things people say is there's a rail line from Santa Clarita down to downtown Ventura that gets used as a tourist trap and not to com have people be commuters. And so that's an issue that matters to me. Another one that matters to me is the fact that the Amtrak line that we've got on the Central Coast, part of it's going into the ocean and the other part of it cuts away from the population centers of Lompoc and Santa Maria, leading to more cars in the road. So housing and transportation are actually two of the biggest climate change issues. And so if I wanted to attack uh, climate change and work on the Green New Deal, transportation might be a strategic one for me to get on. And a second choice would be the Higher Education Committee. I think that's an obvious one for me. I'm a community college trustee and one of my main focuses as someone working in Sacramento for the past 10 years has been tuition-free college, so I'd be able to make a lot of impact there. Thank you. Thank you. We will wrap up this question with Charles. Um, there we go. Uh, personally, I would like to go on to the uh, Accountability and Ways and Means Commission. So uh, hopefully we can stop government from wasting so much of our... <laughs> hard-earned tax dollars that we send to them. Uh, but other committees, that's, that's up to my constituents if I get elected. I'm running for the people, not where I want to be in government. I'm running for where the people want me to be based off of uh, commissions and groups within Sacramento's political machine that I don't trust personally. But it's up to you guys. I'm, I'm where you want me to be. Thank you. Thank you. We're, this is going to be our last question. Stephen Blum, I'll start with you. Steve, the question is, what will you do to protect a woman's right to reproductive choice in an environment of eroding rights and the threat of judicial intervention? Um, everything I can. Um, I firmly believe in a woman's right to choose. Um, and I don't think it's up to other people to decide. I think the Supreme Court got it right in Griswold and Roe v. Wade and Lawrence v. Texas when they said that privacy is a fundamental right um, and people have the right to privacy for a reason um, and women should be able to control their own bodies and make their own choices. And I know it's upsetting to a lot of people and I think it's very unfortunate that it's such a divisive issue. Um, but that's where I stand on it. Thank you. We'll go on to Jonathan. Same question. I firmly stand with the idea that it's a woman's right to choose what to do with her own body. I'm proud to have a 100% rating from Planned Parenthood. That meant a lot to me and to, to get that uh, endorsement, or not, not an endorsement, but a 100% rating. What I would offer is that in California, last legislative session, we passed a bill that required the medicated abortions to be available at UC and CSU campuses. As a community college trustee, I would have liked that benefit to be extended to the community colleges. So one of the first things I do in Sacramento is introduce legislation to expand that program to the community college campuses, which again have 2.1 million students compared to the hundreds of thousands in the UC and CSU system. So we'd be able to impact a lot more people that way. And also in terms of the federal government, California has been leading the way in the nation in uh, suing the federal government at any intervention when they can to protect our values here, and I'd support that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Charles, same question. What will you do to protect a woman's right to reproductive choice in an environment of eroding rights and the threat of judicial intervention? Um, just a short one. I am not a believer in late-term abortion late-term abortion, or during or after birth, abortion. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Bennett, same question. Uh, like uh, many of the candidates up here, I also have received a 100% rating from Planned Parenthood. I think that uh, five of us uh, received that, and all five of those candidates should be proud of, of receiving that. Um, so I stand 100% behind uh, the efforts of Planned Parenthood, um, the efforts of women in this country to make sure that they can uh, uh, continue to have the right uh, to make their own choices about uh, their bodies and about their pregnancies. Um, as uh, Jonathan 
Jonathan pointed out, uh, the state of California uh, does have at least a, a loud voice and a legal voice that they can use to help support um, a, a counterattack because it, uh, the judicial system uh, is putting women and the right to choose at great risk right now. And the question is, how long can we hang on? And we, the other thing that we have to do is take responsibility to make sure we elect a president and we control the Senate uh, because that's where this fight's going to ultimately be thank, won. Thank, thank you. you. And Kathy, same question. Thank you. If Roe v. Wade is repealed, California will and should remain a safe place for women to have an abortion and control their future. I, too, have the 100% pro-choice rating from Planned Parenthood. I'm proud of that. Uh, in the state legislature, I'll make sure that we continue to fund uh, Planned Parenthood for all the health care services that they provide um, for low-income people and men as well. Um, I mentor teens in my work, and I always tell them, you have a choice about starting a family or not starting a family or pursuing a career. I've never had kids. I, I always wanted to be a career woman. I always wanted to be someone who earned my way. That's why I worked hard in school, and um, I've never depended on anybody except myself, and that's what I'm teaching these these young women um, that they can uh, forge their future. Thank you. Jason, same question, please. So as I mentioned earlier, 100% from Planned Parenthood. Going through the uh, process last month with my wife in the hospital where we had to make medical decisions on the fly, very serious decisions. And, and my wife, as I mentioned, has her doctorate and then did two residencies in Texas and Dallas and Houston. And we were at the mercy of, of the doctors. So I can't imagine what it's like being in a country where you don't speak the language or don't have that type of education, having to deal with our medical care system. It must just be a nightmare. So we really need to preserve the autonomy of individuals, particularly women. When we lived in Texas, we met in Houston. She was working at MD Anderson. This was when Texas was shutting down their women's clinics, and they were using this law that said you needed to be more like a hospital. And so there were great swaths of Texas where you couldn't get medical care, and it was just incredible that in the, in the 21st century that this was happening. Thank you. And we'll wrap up with you, Elsa. So I, too, have the 100% rating uh, from Planned Parenthood and wear that proudly. Um, I, 100% um, without any restriction, uh, support a woman's right to make decisions over her own body. Many of you know that I work at Standing Together to End Sexual Assault. I see sexual assault and reproductive justice as two expressions of the same thing the control of women's bodies under patriarchy. And I am someone who will defend that, uh, that uh, we have the right to control our own bodies. And I uh, am very thankful to uh, Assemblymember Limon and Senator Hannah-Beth Jackson for their work in this area, uh, because uh, they have, um, in addition to others before them, but they have created conditions such that if we are under uh, attack for this issue at the federal level, we can shore up our own issues. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this concludes the questions. We're going to start candidate statements in just a moment. But before I do that, I'd like to take a moment to thank you all for coming out here tonight. Uh, it's very important to hear these questions, to have it broadcast. And we can't ask them questions if you're not here to give us them. So thank you all for that. I'd also like to thank TVSB for videotaping. Gary Atkins and his stellar job running the audio. I'd like to thank Transil Pro for their translation services. And from the league, we had Vijay, Vijaya, Shane, Rave, Linda, and Lisa, our timers over there. How about a round of applause for our volunteers? And just FYI, the League will be holding one more forum on Thursday, February 6th from 6 to 8. This is for candidates running for the office of Santa Barbara County's Board of Supervisors, 3rd District. That forum will be held at the Goleta Valley Community Center, 5679 Hollister Avenue. So if you're interested, come up and see me later. I can repeat that address. So we will begin. We are giving the candidates only 15 seconds. I'm just joking. <laughs> We're going to give them a full 90 seconds for their closing statements. We're going to begin at the opposite end. Candidate Steve Bennett, 90 seconds. 
Thank, thank you very much, and I want to thank everybody that made eye contact tonight. It al always helps the speakers. Um, you, as you've listened to us tonight, you can see that there are many candidates up here with progressive values. And I think that the question facing Santa Barbara County voters is not who has progressive values, but who's going to be effective in implementing those progressive values. Uh, I feel like I have a track record of, of some things that I want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, certainly passing the SOAR initiatives was a challenge to uh, the local developers that controlled local government with their big campaign contributions, et cetera. Uh, and that was a massive effort uh, that required organizing almost a thousand uh, volunteers, uh, raising over one and a half million dollars and taking on the development industry twice uh, to pass initiatives for the cities and the county. Uh, I have, after shortly after doing that, I then wrote the toughest campaign contribution limit law um, in the state of California uh, for Ventura County, and it's reduced the influence of big money uh, in politics. I've been a firm, I've been a strong fighter for programs for the vulnerable, the foster children, seniors in their nursing homes. Um, low-income people that need help. We just uh, we just adopted, Supervisor Zaragoza and myself pushed it through, a farm worker resource program. I'm proud that I've earned the endorsements of the California Professional Firefighters, the California Teachers Association, and Sierra Club. I hope I can earn your support tonight also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next candidate is Stephen Blum. Thanks. Um, well, again, thank you for being here. And if elected, I can know and, and would love to opportunity to help the state. Um, I'm a native Californian. I came to Ventura County 46 years ago. I love it here. This is paradise. I want to help keep it that way. Um, as I said, I, I'm confident I have the experience to do this job. But I also have the desire to do the job for, for various reasons. One, um, California has been very good to me. I was well, My family was on welfare when, when I was a child. And, and, and so you paid for my room and board. Uh, I went to college on California State Scholarship, so the citizens of this um, state paid for my education. I've never forgotten the state's generosity, and every job I've had has involved helping other people, and this would be one more. Um, and I, instead of trying to tell you how wonderful I am, let me um, read what Sue Keith, a fellow community college state board member, because um, she spoke better than I can. Um, if you want to, me to extol Stephen's excellent qualities, I wouldn't have a difficult time. He is intelligent without being overbearing, a wonderful colleague. He is perceptive and can see issues before they arise and will bring humor, common sense, and sensitivity in order to achieve consensus. Stephen Blum is uniquely qualified to be a state legislator. And don't forget to donate. <laughs> Thank you. Our next candidate is Elsa Granados. This month, I celebrate 23 years of leading STESA. This is an agency which meets the needs of everyday people. The prevention of sexual assault is a complicated and widespread issue. The solutions are not easy, but we work every day to address them. I have a long-standing record of working with people of diverse backgrounds and languages to bring them their voice to the table to better access government and other structures of power as they seek justice. The issues before us today are ones that, as well, are complex and difficult to find solutions. But it's going to take a strong leader to stand up to special interests who would otherwise distract us from developing viable solutions. I'm an advocate. At its core, that's the job of a California Assembly member. I will advocate on behalf of my district and on behalf of the residents of California to address the pressing needs before us. If you want someone who will listen to you, will do her homework, think for herself, and make decisions in the best interest of all of us, then I'm your person. Tonight, I ask you to support me and our shared values with your vote. Si quieren alguien que trabaje por sus intereses y no para los intereses especiales que influyen a otros candidatos, voten por mí. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Our next candidate is Jonathan Abood. Thank you, and thank you, everybody who watched at home today and who's here in the audience. I think how you campaign matters. How you campaign reflects on how you're going to govern. I'll tell you a little bit of how I've been campaigning. I spend hours a day with my, I have my shoes on. You can see them after the debate. Uh, I, I spend hours a day going and talking to voters face-to-face 
to tell them about myself, but also to really hear their concerns. So to couple the long list of to-do list items I already have from voters and what they'd like to see, plus my extensive experience advocating for our community and getting results in Sacramento, I think that's how I'm going to be the most effective state assembly member for the people of the 37th district because I've already done the legwork and I'm still doing it of meeting people and hearing their issues and hearing their views. And then I'm going to take that to Sacramento and work with everybody. It's not going to be just me up in Sacramento getting things done. It's going to be all of us working together to make it happen. I'd like to list some of the endorsements that I've received in the race, which are the California Young Democrats, the Santa Barbara and Ventura Young Democrats, along with the Campus Democrats at UCSB, former Mayor of Santa Barbara, Hal Conklin, former Santa Barbara County Auditor and Controller, Bob Geis, former District Attorney, Stan Roden, and Karen Schur, who's the President of the Oxnard Union High School District Board of Trustees, and Lori Brown, who's a Ventura City Council member. I'm proud of these endorsements because these are people I've worked with to get things done, and I'd love to earn your vote, and thank you. I'd love to meet you. My phone number is 310-734-9791, votaboo.gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate is Jason Dominguez. Like we said earlier, what's the most important thing is someone who's going to be effective at getting things done. And one of the things you need to look at is what have they gotten done in the past? Is it just lip service? So a few more things that I didn't mention earlier, the, the Santa Barbara smoking ban, I'm particularly proud of putting that in front of our council and getting support so we no longer can smoke in our beaches, our parks, or on State Street. Um, I put forth a ranked choice voting because we need to have effective voting. People should be able to vote. I supported district uh, elections in Oxnard and Santa Maria, and as a result of that, we have great leaders like Vina Lopez and Gloria Soto. Um, I supported our bike master plan, and I said no to some really bad ideas, like the Tahiguas Resource Recovery S Project. That's already almost 100% over budget. I opposed the $100 million giveaway to J.P. Morgan. So this is the thing. When you get to Sacramento, you have to say no to special interests, and I have a track record not only of building some great projects, but saying no to these folks. I think health care is going to be the single biggest issue the legislature deals with in the next term. It not only, of course, impacts your health, but it impacts the economy in terms of how we pay our public employees. The benefits is such a huge part of it. Competitive, competitiveness for the private sector, for example. We're competing with other countries that give their employees health care, and we're not competitive in health care. Our health care is super expensive, particularly relative to what you get for it. So let's send to Sacramento, someone with experience, jasondominguez.org. Thank you, and our next candidate is Charles Cole. Um, just raise of hands, how many of you think your legislature is doing your bidding, doing what you want? Go ahead, anybody, everybody, nope, yeah, kinda. Well, absolutely they should be. I'm here to listen to what you have to say, Republican, Democrat, Independent, whatever. I'm here for you. We have to bring us all together so we can make this state great. It, we, we are having problems with a lot of issues. And the machine in Sacramento is not helping things. I, I ask for your vote just so you have your voice back in the state elections. Call for assembly.com. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And our last candidate is Kathy Murillo. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for holding this event tonight. I'm proud of my endorsements in the field of education. I have Jack O'Connell, former state superintendent of public instruction. He was also the former assembly member and state senator in this area. I have the Ventura County Women's Political Council, the California Federation of Teachers, the Ventura School Board President, Sabrina Rodriguez, and a majority of the Santa Barbara K-12 School Board. In terms of the environment, I have Cause Action Fund and the California Environment Justice Alliance. Both Cause and SEHA are strong defenders of the natural environment. They look out for low-income families, making sure industry does not harm vulnerable populations. In Orman, uh, in Ventura, I have the Orman Beach Observers as, um, as an endorsement. And here in CARP, Al Clark, thank you, Al. Um, for the economy, I have uh, State Controller Betty Yee and Civil Rights and Workers' Rights Leader Dolores Huerta. I'm endorsed by the Central Coast Labor Council, the California Labor Federation, and the California Latino Legislative Caucus. 
Um, as mayor of a full service city, um, I've made budget and policy decisions related to functioning airport, harbor, uh, fire and police department. I was a strong and brave leader during drought and during the fire and debris flow disasters. Um, I ask for your vote. I'm ready for this job. I'm ready to serve you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of announcements, but first, how about a round of applause for these great candidates? So candidates, thank you very much for joining us this evening. We appreciate your commitment to serve our community. Thank you to the audience as well for attending. We hope you found the program informative and useful as you prepare to vote. Uh, as I mentioned, if you wish to make a donation at the League, the website is www.lwvsantabarbara.org. Finally, please make sure you are correctly registered to vote and then make sure you vote. Mail-in ballots, as we said, are going out. The election is Tuesday, March uh, 3rd, and that clock, 8 o'clock, that's my job, is to end on time so you all get to go home. So thank you all. Good night.